feeling today? Come on. I want to say what's up to everybody here in Gahanna? Northwest, we love you over at Northwest Campus. Come on, let, let Northwest feel your love over there. Come on. Everybody joining us online, good to see you. Thanks for being a part of today. When I say good to see you, I mean I can't see you, but I, I believe you're out there, and I know you're wonderful. Thank you for coming to One Big Party. Uh, our theme is uh, never the same, and we just, uh, we really believe that although our flesh in this season has been totally uncomfortable and out of whack, we just believe in our spirit that God is doing something unique and powerful, and uh, we want to we wanna walk in that. Uh, 2020 has been crazy, right? All the memes are true. <laughs> you know, it's like 2020, pull over, let me out. All right, I want to walk. I'll walk, okay? I, like, it's all true. And yet, what's amazing is there's something about those crazy times. There's something about when our flesh is disrupted and our normal is, has been thrown off that God does something powerful. And I just want to report to you as a church that we have been more effective as a church than we've ever been in our lives. It turns out Jesus meant it when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He meant that. And so uh, I want to kind of just quickly sort of take a cliff note, kind of quick version of a story and share some stats and some things with you of what's happened. You know, um, okay, so let's rewind. Like a year before COVID, our team, our production team, our communications team came to me and they said, Pastor, we need to uh, invest in our live stream. I was like, I don't know about that. I, I, honestly, I was pushing back. I'm like, man, if we make it too good, folks aren't even going to come to church, man. They're just going to lay in bed, ba bedside Baptist, Reverend Mattress. They're, they're just going to sit there on their phone, petting their puppy dogs and sipping their coffee. They're, even, they're not even going to come get into community and relationship and, 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 you know, and everything. They're like, no, I'm telling you, if you do it, like when folks travel, they'll still be able to be connected. They can share it with their friends and family. It's a, it's a, it's a non-threatening way to kind of share stuff with people, and, and they said, we're going to be able to reach people, ignite the movement that we talk about, and, and, uh, and so I, I really caved in. I was like, okay, you know, it, it makes sense. Let's do it. So a year before COVID, we developed in the, the infrastructure and, and raised money and did what we needed to do to have the infrastructure so that when things did shut down in March, we didn't miss a beat. Like, we were ready to be as effective as we've ever been, and so I want to tell you, he, here's some stats I want to give you of what's happened since quarantine, since the shutdown, since March, um, we, we've been able to reach people, engage with people in 39 different states of, of our uh, 50 states, and then 33 countries around the world. 171 online new guests have gotten connected. Now, I'm not just talking about 171 people watching the content. I'm talking about 171 people connected in community since the shutdown. 149 salvations since the shutdown. Um, we have seven, right now we have 78 connect groups. People from nine different countries are connected in our groups. So again, th these are people that, people know their name, they know their name, they're journeying through life together from nine different countries. Um, people streamed, by the way, the answer is Jesus, which we released at, at Easter. We said, hey, look, everybody's got questions. Whatever the question, the answer is Jesus. That went to uh, 63 different countries, people have been streaming that. Um, okay, so the video that you just saw, the teaser, which we're going to watch the whole video here in a little bit, 32 people were baptized. Of those 32 people, 14 of those people did not go to our church pre-COVID. They did not go to our church pre-quarantine. They joined our church during quarantine. You remember the Love Finds a Way that, that we did when uh, basically record unemployment, people were... Uh, not sure how they were going to get food. They weren't sure how they were going to pay bills. And so we said, look, if you can give, give. And so we created where we were sharing internally. Because of your giving, we were able to help 430 families, both in our church and in our uh, extended community in Columbus, through Love Finds a Way because of your faithfulness. So I just want to say, church, yes. First of all, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for giving financially. I want to say thank you for continuing to engage with our church, for commenting, sharing, for being a part of, of groups, um, for, for not just backing off, but for moving ahead. And I just want to affirm our leaders. I want to affirm our teams. Uh, if, if you saw our Zoom calls and our work weeks, I mean, our team is going, how do we serve our church? How do we serve our church? How do we serve our church? And so your, your faithfulness, your willingness to give time, energy, and money um, into our calling, which is people during this time, 
um, the fruit is massive. I want to tell you, our, our care team made 1,452 phone calls. You remember what phone calls are? Not text message. I'm talking phone call. Like pick up the phone, talk to a person. Remember that? Four, 1,452 of those took place during the quarantine because our team said, you know, again, not just staff, um, Servant leaders stepped up and said, I'm going to be a part of playing offense. We're going to push back the kingdom of darkness. We're going to step up to the plate. I'm going to lend my sword to the fight. I'm going to do my part of it. And so we have continued to play offense through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well done. Well done. Great job. I want to uh, jump into this message. It's a new day. And I want to actually start with this uh, concept. My wife sent me an article a little while ago on a thing called surge capacity. Surge capacity. Let me define it for you real quick. Surge capacity is a collection of adaptive systems, mental and physical, that humans draw on for short-term survival in acutely stressful situations. Surge capacity is something like a psychologist, psychiatrist would tell you that when you are in a highly stressful situation, you become razor sharp. And, and so, like, if this building was on fire, it would just be like, you would just, whoosh, like, laser focus, you'd figure stuff out, you'd get stuff done, and you would hit this energy wave in your physical and your mental capacities. And so God made us that way to be able to do it, but it's a short-term thing. The article talked about how, as a world, we had to go into surge capacity when COVID hit. Think back in your business, your organization, when as soon as COVID hit, everybody went, whoa, like laser focused. You remember your first Zoom meeting? It was awesome. Your first Zoom meeting was amazing. Like everybody's like, man, we, we're not going to let COVID shut us down. Come on, everybody lock in. And it was like, everybody unmute. Team on three, one, two, three. Yeah. I mean, it was like, take the hill, uh, brave heart type stuff. At the beginning of COVID, teams were functioning well, great communication, great energy. We're going to do this. We're going to make it. That was surge capacity. We had it as a whole culture and society. Well, what the article says is over time, you run out of surge capacity. So if you're still in a crisis and you're still in an acutely stressful situation and you run out of surge capacity, what do you do then? If you keep trying to live in this surge capacity, eventually you will burn out. And that's why we're seeing right now, now that we're several months into this and we still have a ways to go, not just with COVID, but in the middle of that, we had, um, you know, we had issues of, of social justice, right? We're in the middle of politics. If there was no COVID, we would still be in crazy time based on the polarity of, of voting and Democrats and Republicans and all the issues and all the tension, it's just there. But what we do is we create this, well, we didn't create it, it's here, this massive system. And so we're not out of the woods yet. Like these things aren't just going to go away, but we're out of surge capacity. That's why everybody you talk to is like, I'm, I'm exhausted, man. I'm tired. Some of you feel numb. You feel numb. You're just like, I don't even know what to feel. I just know I don't have much left. So there are these sort of feelings of hopelessness. And, and so uh, I want to talk about this because how do we move forward when there's consistent, continued chaos with confidence? How do, how do I move forward in confidence, be able to walk through this, find an energy source, um, something to help me make decisions? How, how can I walk through what I have to walk through next when I'm out of surge capacity? Here's what I want to do. I want to take you to Luke chapter 18. So if you have your Bible, go there. If not, don't worry. We'll put it up on the screen. Luke chapter 18 is... Um, really starts the whole process of Jesus going to the cross. And it wasn't just Jesus going to the cross. He was really had this collection, he had this team of 12 disciples that had journeyed with him. They watched him uh, feed the 5,000. They, they watched him uh, raise Lazarus from the dead. They watched him heal sick people. They saw him walk on water. They heard his pr profound teaching. And yet they were getting ready to walk into this acutely stressful pandemic type of COVID-19 situation, the cross and all that was going to be threatening them, their lives, their livelihoods and everything. And so here's how it starts out. Luke 18, Jesus calls a, a Zoom meeting. You can picture it, 13 different uh, gallery squares in there, okay, and Jesus and his 12 disciples calls them together and he says, listen, we're going to Jerusalem where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man, speaking of himself, will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans. He will be mocked, treated shamefully, and spit upon. They will flog him with a whip and kill him. But on the third day, he will rise again. Okay. So Jesus, with unbelievable detail, way in advance, gives the disciples the itinerary for Easter. The details. In fact, it, it, it would have looked something like this. Go ahead and bring it up. 
All right, boys, everybody pay close attention because I don't want you to say you didn't know. We're, going, we're about to get clear. All right, everybody, ready? Here we go. Friday, for all you detail hounds, I'm, I'm going to take all the questions out right now. Okay, number one, first thing, I'm going to be handed over to the Romans. After that, mocked. After that, treated shamefully. Then I will be spit upon. Following that, I will be flogged with a whip. And then I will be killed. Any questions? Anybody? Anybody? Any, anything in the chat? Anybody put anything in the chat? Nothing in the chat. All right. Anything? Peter? Peter, you're muted. Peter, you're muted. Unmute. What? Oh, no, you're talking to yourself. Okay, fine. Nobody has any questions. Saturday. Dead. Any questions? Nobody? All right. Sunday, I will rise again. We all good? Everybody good? All right. Team on three. I mean, how clear do you have to be? Luke 18, he literally gives them the details of what's about to happen, the details, the data, it's all there. That's Luke 18. Luke 22, four chapters later, the itinerary is about to kick off. And it says that Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives as usual, and his disciples followed him, verse 40. On reaching the place, he said to them, watch this, pray that you will not fall into temptation. I want you to connect these dots here, that Jesus told them all the information in chapter 18, but in chapter 22, he says, even though you have all the information, I want you to pray. Because even though you have the information, there's something about chaos there's something about acutely stressful situations. There's something about threats to your life and your livelihood that will cause you to be short-sighted. And even though you know I'm supposed to be arrested and you know I'm going to be flogged and you know I'm going to be spit upon and you know I'm going to be dead for three days and you know I'm eventually going to come back, even though you know everything you need to know, there's something about the crazy time that will cause you to be vulnerable to temptation. So he said, I want you to pray so that your flesh doesn't overwhelm your spirit and become the leader in the relationship. I want you to pray. And friend, I've got to tell you, prayer is productive. Prayer is productive. Everything that you pray your way into gets better. You got a big conflict you need to have? Pray your way into it. The conflict will get better. You got a big decision you need to make? Pray your way into the decision. The decision will get better. You want to have a good work day? Pray your way into the work day. You've got a temptation that's facing you? Pray your way into and through the temptation. Everything you pray for, everything you pray your way into gets better. You want a better marriage? Stop bickering and start praying together. You, you, you want to have a better day? Start, shut everything off on the commute. Start praying your way into the commute. You, you want to walk through the situation better? Pray your way through the situation instead of choosing to sit and think about and fret about all the ways it could go sideways and all the ways it could fall apart. Just pray your way into it. Pray your way through it. Prayer is productive. And I'll tell you why prayer is productive. Because prayer aligns us to God's will. Prayer aligns us to God's will. One of the reasons people think prayer isn't productive is because they only pray their own will. <laughs> We only pray our own will. Have you ever had a great plan that was your will and you just needed God to pay the bill? I, I got my will. I just need you to pay the bill. I, I got the plan. I've whiteboarded it. I've action stepped it. I've got it in Microsoft Excel. I've PowerPointed it. Um, I, I've got the strategy. I've thought it out. I did the mastermind. I'm all, I'm all in. I just need you, Lord. Now I'm just going to bring it to you. Once I've baked it, I'm going to bring it to you because I need you to put the icing on the cake. <laughs> If you've ever done that, you know prayer is, that prayer is not all that productive <laughs> because, because prayer is not about us getting God aligned to our will. It's us aligning our will to God's will. There's nothing wrong with you praying and asking God for something. That's okay. It says in Ephesians that 
you know, tell God what you need. It's okay to pray. You can come confidently before the throne of grace and, and all of that. But you, you got to understand that the end game of all you ever do is pray your will to God. You're going to be sorely disappointed that he's not executing on your finite human plans instead of you becoming aligned to his infinite godly wisdom and going with what the Father wants to do. Watch what happens here with Jesus. So Jesus tells the disciples, pray so you won't fall into temptation. But look what it says that he did. Look what he practices It says, he withdrew, Jesus, a a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and prayed. Now watch his prayer, verse 42. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus made a request. Father, if there's any way to circumvent the cross, if there's any way for us to come up with a plan B, I'm kind of dreading this. I don't know that I've got the surge capacity for it. It's going to be exhausting. My body's going to give out. I'm actually going to need help carrying the cross. I don't have what it takes. I don't feel like I have enough to do it. Lord, if, you got, if we can come up with a different plan, I'll do it. But hey, what's more important than my plan is your plan. Not my will, but your will be done. The point of prayer is not to get God to do what I want him to do. It's for me to understand what he wants me to do. So here's what the disciples do. Jesus tells them, look, you already have the itinerary, but pray so you don't give in to temptation. And the disciples, when they were supposed to pray, they were exhausted and they fell asleep. Jesus wakes them up. Hey, hey, guys, come on. The itinerary is about to hit. We're about to go through some stuff. I need you to wake up and pray so you won't be tempted. You're out of your surge capacity. You're out of your ability. The threat's coming. I need you to be locked in. And walking in the spirit, and the only way you're going to be able to walk in the spirit is if you pray your way into the situation. Pray, and they fall asleep again. And he wakes them up again, and they fall asleep again. So when they were supposed to pray, they slept. And so here's what happens. It says in verse 49, when the other disciples saw what was about to happen, you see, what happened is the Romans show up to arrest Jesus, just like he said back in Luke 18, that I'm going to be handed over to the Romans. When the arrest that Jesus predicted and said was supposed to happen started to happen, so when the other disciples saw what was about to happen, they exclaimed, Lord, should we fight? We brought the swords. And one of them struck the high priest's slave in the ear, slashing his right ear off. And Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. All right. This is, this is about, it's about to get good. So if your neighbor's asleep, wake them up. All right, because this is, this is important stuff. The disciples, like, we know that the person that cut the ear off was Peter because this story is told in, in all the Gospels. And in, in John, it mentions Peter by name, that he was the one that cut the ear off. And I got to be honest, if I was Peter and I slept instead of prayed and I wasn't walking in the spirit, I probably would have done the same thing. Because I'm tired. I'm threatened, and I'm out of surge capacity, and I'm in the flesh. And my flesh is the type that you come and threaten somebody I love, and I happen to have a sword, you're going to lose an ear. And by the way, I'm going to tell you even more why Peter, in many ways, was justified in what he did. Watch this. In Luke 22, same chapter, if you back up to verse 36, right before they go out to the Mount of Olives, it says that here's what Jesus says to the disciples. He says, but now take your money and traveler's bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. So Jesus tells them to buy swords. And it goes on, and and they they count up their swords. How many swords do we have? They had two swords. Two swords. And Jesus said, well, that's enough. So there's 12 disciples, two swords. They get there. Jesus has primed them with the word swords. They go out to pray. They're tired, so tired, they can't stay awake to pray. They fall asleep. No more surge capacity. I'm in my flesh, threats here. Jesus said sword. He must want us in a sword fight. (laughs) But did Jesus want them in a sword fight? The answer is no. We know Jesus didn't want them in a sword fight for two reasons. Number one, We know he didn't want him in a sword fight for two reasons. Number one, when he said, have a sword, and they said, we only have two, he said, that's enough. If you're going in a sword fight and you have 12 people, you need 12 swords. You don't want 10 people standing there going, dude, you can do it. You can do it. No, we need all, we need everybody with a sword. So he wasn't intending for a sword fight. 
We also know he didn't intend for a sword fight because when Peter cut the man's ear off, Jesus stopped and called off the whole thing and healed the man's ear. So he, didn't, he intended for them to have a sword, but he didn't want them to go fight that fight right then and there. Now here's what I'm going to tell you. If you walk in the flesh, even in the principles from the Bible and things that Jesus said, and yet you don't do what Jesus said to do here, which is to pray in real time that I don't fall into temptation, you'll do some things that make logical sense to your flesh that are not the will of God. And you don't know because you were walking in the flesh. And you can use the words of Jesus to go, well, he told me to have a sword. Yeah, he told you to have a sword, but he didn't tell you to stab the man in the ear. Just because you have a point doesn't mean you ought to be stabbing people with it all the time. Just because you have a couple points, we got two swords, doesn't mean that it's the will of God that you go around stabbing people with your points whenever you feel like it. And even though you can justify, well, oh, but Jesus said have a sword. He didn't tell you to use it. You didn't even pray before you posted that thing. You didn't even pray before you said that thing. You didn't even pray before you picked that fight. You didn't even pray before you cut that person's ear off. All you did was took a principle and something that Jesus said before, and you didn't say, God, do you want me to do this now? So Jesus says, you better pray so you don't give in to temptation. And the temptation is going to be to get in your flesh. And when you're tired and when you're in your flesh, people get their ears cut off. And Jesus said, I don't want his ear cut off. Jesus said, I didn't intend for you to. Well, then why would you want me to have a sword, Jesus? Well, you don't know because you didn't pray when I told you to. Maybe if you would have prayed instead of falling asleep, the Father would have told you what to do with your sword. And the thing he tells you to do Wednesday, he might tell you to do something else on Thursday. We can't just hang on principles. We have to go to the person. We have to go to God. We have to go, Lord, what do you want me to do right now? Sometimes day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment. God, what do you want me to do right now in my marriage? What do you want me to do right now in this relationship? And sometimes it's, the answer is shut up. And sometimes the answer is speak up. And sometimes the answer is stand up. And sometimes the answer is stand down. Sometimes it's use the sword. Sometimes it's put it away. But you don't know unless you pray. We got to walk in the spirit. When you're in chaotic times, chaotic times will cause you to overreact or underreact in your flesh. We don't want to overreact or underreact. We want to walk in the spirit. How do we walk in the spirit in crazy times? We pray. We don't fall asleep in the garden. We pray. We pray, Lord, what do you want me to do? God, what are you telling me to do? Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, here's what I'd like to see happen, but not my will, but your will be done. I become aligned to God's will. Now, here's what happens. Because they didn't pray, even though they were full of information, they could see that they knew the big picture, but in chaos, you forget about the big picture, you become short-sighted. You can be a big person and become very petty in a moment. Because of the chaos, I'm out of surge capacity. So because they didn't pray, they forgot the itinerary. They lost sight of what Jesus said in Luke 18. And so here's what happens. Jesus goes to the cross. He's crucified. Everything he said was going to happen was happening. He was beaten with whips. He was flogged. Uh, he was spit upon. He was treated shamefully. He was crucified. He was killed. He was in the tomb. Three days later, he resurrects. And guess what the disciples did the whole time because they didn't pray. You know what they did the whole time? They had anxiety. They had fear. They went behind locked doors. They hid in terror. They had no peace at all because they didn't pray when they should have prayed. So Jesus finally comes back Sunday night having lived up to the exact itinerary he gave them in Luke 18. And it says in John 20 verse 19, that Sunday evening... The disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. And finally, it says here, they were filled with joy when they saw him. Isn't that sad? I mean, if you just read that verse by itself, you'd be like, oh, that's a cool story. Except when you think of it in light of the context of Luke 18, that they knew all the way back in Luke 18 that they didn't need to be afraid. They knew all the way back in Luke 18 that actually 
it was the will of God that Jesus would be arrested in the garden. You don't need to cut anyone's ear off. Jesus doesn't need you running in and defending him. In fact, in Matthew 26, by the way, Matthew 26, it tells the account of the, the ear being cut off. Jesus says, put away your sword. Those who use the sword, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Don't you realize, watch this, Jesus says, if I wanted to, I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly. That the short-sighted nature of where they were at, they forgot about the fact Jesus had fed 5,000. They forgot about the fact he walked on water. They forgot about the fact he raised Lazarus. And they forgot about the fact he gave them all the details and the data that they needed. And in that moment, they had anxiety the whole time, all the way until he finally showed up at the end. And they didn't need to. You know what they could have had on Friday? Peace. You know what they could have had on Saturday? Joy. You know what they could have had on Sunday, even before he showed up Sunday night? One big party. And then when Jesus showed up, they would have been like, hey, what took you so long? We've been waiting on you the whole time. Well, come on, let's throw it down. Whatever the question, the answer is in. No need to worry. They could have partied the whole time, but they were full of anxiety because they didn't pray when they were supposed to pray. And so they fell into temptation. We're not going to do that. Not us. Because we're in our own pandemic and we're in our own acutely stressful situation and we're not out of the woods yet. But you know what? We don't need more details. We don't need more data. We need the direction of God in moment by moment, day by day, right there to walk through us, to give us the peace and the joy and the answers that we need when we need them. You don't need to have a panic attack on Friday. You don't need to be stressed out on Saturday. You can have peace the entire day time. And friend, I want to tell you, I don't ever want to be the same. The lessons that I've learned in this process, I want to take with me everywhere. And probably the biggest one that I've learned is dependence upon Jesus, dependence upon God, praying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, help me to get through right now what I need right now. Help me make the right decision right now instead of thinking I've got it figured out. Okay. I end with this. When all this stuff shut down, uh, I, I didn't know what to feel. I didn't know what to think. I, I was thinking the same stuff you guys were around what's going to happen and what does this mean. And what I start reading articles and following threads and I'm hearing, oh, this is the worst thing ever and it's never going to be the same and it's all going to be whatever. And, 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 and I got to tell you, there was a part of me that felt threatened. I probably felt what the disciples felt when the Romans were coming in to arrest Jesus. I have my sword out. I'm like, oh, what do I do? Because my, my entire, you know, life was on the line here. Like, when my wife and I moved here 10 years ago, we put all of our money in to help this church get started. We put all of our stuff. We left everybody we knew, all our familiar friends, came to a new place, took a big risk, and God just blessed it. And we walked by faith. And, you know, we didn't have a building for a long time. And then God blessed us with this building. And then he blessed us with the Northwest building. And, and, and so here as a church community, we've grown. And, and, and there's now there was some um, stability and, and people, story after story of what God was doing and great things happening. And, and this thing is building and growing and we're starting to see the horizon and we're starting to learn sort of how to organize it and how to understand it and everything. We're getting the systems and the structure and, and feeling like there was at least some predictability to what was going on. And, and then this COVID thing happens and I'm like, oh, are we, are we going to lose everything? Like, Lots of people are unemployed, record unemployment. I'm looking at the bills that we have as a church, and I'm looking at the things, the endeavors, the things that we bid off to do, and I'm looking at 25 staff members that, that, that feed their families through what we're doing, and I'm like, what is going to happen? Are people going to, are they going to stop coming to church? Are they going to stop giving financially? Are they going to quit caring about this? Is this all going to go away? And, and so I start to feel these things, and on top of that, I can't even be around people now, and so I create a makeshift office in my basement surrounded by cinder walls and I'm in this I'm down here in an antique desk and a futon and I'm like feeling this like what do I what do I do and my flesh was all jacked up my flesh was thinking here you came here and just when it was starting to get good it's about to fall apart and my flesh was starting to become afraid and so I thought you know what the most productive thing I can do right now is to go into the presence of God that's that's the most pr productive thing I can do is pray because I don't have all the answers and if I might jump into a strategy and it's the wrong one and I might, I might try to do something that's the wrong one and my flesh, my flesh cannot be trusted. I wanna pray. So I would sit down on this 
dirty futon in my basement and I would listen to worship music and the Lord would remind me of a scripture about I will build my church if the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against it. COVID-19's got no shot. And I'd be sitting down there and I'd think about scriptures like he who began a good work. He said, being confident of this, he who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Took me to 2 Timothy 1, for I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded He's able to keep what I've committed unto him against that day. And I would just sit there and I would become aligned to the Father. And, and it was like, Lord, help me make the next right decision. And we're hearing, man, people can't eat. People don't have money for food. They don't have what they need. And so we're like, you know what? We're going to raise money so that we can give it away. And then we're like, well, that, I, well, we still have to pay our bills. And what, is it going to happen? But we just said, this is the next right decision. My flesh didn't, wasn't there because I've, I've got responsibilities. We have responsibilities here. Ultimately, I'm responsible as the leader of the organization. I signed on the loans. I did this stuff. I'm going, well, what if people give to love finds a way and they don't tithe and give to the church and then we can't pay our bills. But well, now we need someone to give us a hand. Like, what's going to happen? And it was like, don't worry about the chaos. That's chaos. Just pray. Pray. Don't sleep. Don't, don't, when you, when, don't take a nap. Pray. Pray. Let, walk in the spirit. It doesn't always, it, it's not always conventional wisdom. You just do what I tell you to do moment by moment, decision by decision, and, and, and we did it. And we were able to help 440, or sorry, 430 families. And on the back end of that, we had one individual that had some really good things happen in their business that showed up and wrote a single check that exceeded the amount that we gave out through Love Finds Way to be able to pay bills that we had here at the church that took care of it, that we had no idea, no idea that was coming. And God said, I will take care of you. I will take care of you. Your confidence, your confidence comes from me. Your confidence comes when you pray and you walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Your confidence comes when you go past your surge capacity and I don't have the mental and physical ability. I feel numb in my flesh. I feel numb in my emotions and yet there's a confidence that wells up to say, he who began a good work in you is going to carry it all the way through to completion, all right? Last thing, promise. This is the last thing and then we're gonna sing. Last weekend, Friday, uh, Sunday, we're going to baptize folks. You remember it was beautiful all last week, and then Sunday, cold front. Thank you very much. So I'm driving on my way to this baptism, and our team's calling me, and they're like, oh, nobody might show up to this one, bro. It's going to be cold out there. It's cold out there. They were putting their toes in the water, and it was freezing. And, and they're like, you know, I, what should we do? And I said, you know what? Whoever shows up wants to be baptized, we'll baptize them. If somebody doesn't want to be baptized, we'll figure out a midweek option. When we get there, what time I get there, all 32 people showed up and all 32 people were like, I'm getting baptized today. Let's do this. <laughs> Ain't no party like a one church party. It don't stop. Let's go. So everybody was like fired up to go and, you know, I get there and I'm in my waders. I had to borrow those things. I've never been hunting or what you probably use waders for fishing, but <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't judge me. Anyways, um. But I was feeling official in those things, you know, so I get out there and, and, and each person, you know, they come out there, you know, they come walking out there and I'm like, you know, it's a big moment, you know, and I'm excited and I'm warm and dry and, um, and I'm like, you know, I, I want to give them a speech, but I, but, but I don't want to talk too long and, you know, then we got to rebuke hypothermia. So I was like, I, they're, they're standing out there and I'm going to tell you what, what I said to them. In fact, if you look close enough, you read my lips, just, what I'm going to tell you is what I told them. This is what I said. I said, listen, from today forward, your confidence and your faith does not come from what you feel. It comes from what you know. Amen. Not what you feel. Because I got to tell you, most of the time, I don't feel righteous. But I know I'm righteous. Because God made he who had no sin to become sin for me that I might become the righteousness of God. I'm righteous, not because I feel righteous, because I've been declared righteous. Most of the time, I don't feel saved, but I'm saved. Most of the time, I don't feel grace but I have grace. I don't feel gracious, but I am gracious. I don't feel good, but I am good. I don't feel holy, but I am holy. I don't feel connected to God, but I am connected to God. I don't feel confident, but I am confident, not because of what I feel, but because of what I know, because of who I know. And that's what happens if you'll pray and you'll praise in the middle of the temptation. Let's not fall asleep in the garden. Let's pray. Let's pray. So in this moment, I invite you to stand up on your feet wherever you're at. 
And regardless of what you feel, you're at the edge of your surge capacity. You may feel numb. You may feel afraid. You may feel anxiety or worry. It doesn't matter what you feel. In this moment, your confidence and your faith builds not in your feeling, not in your adrenaline, not in your emotion, in what you know and who you know. So let's do it in this moment. Let's never be the same. Let's learn the lessons that put no confidence in the flesh, but to walk in the spirit. Come on, church, let's lift up our voice and say,